It is Friday the 7th of October, 2022, and at Manchester Crown Court, seven women and four men shuffle into the jury room at the side of the courtroom. It's been raining in Manchester, of course, and they shake off their coats and umbrellas as they settle down at the large wooden table. Among them, juror number four, a man in his early 40s with three children, could do without all this hassle. He's a local businessman and has managed to avoid a jury summons once before. However, this time around, the court clerk has called his number and now he's been selected for this jury. He's hoping it will be a quick and simple trial, a straightforward burglary, perhaps. With any luck, it will be over in a few days. Jurors in the UK aren't paid and he's self-employed. He can claim up to £64.95 p a day to help cover loss of earnings, but with three kids, that won't go far. The door of the jury room opens, and the Honourable Mr Justice Goss walks in. He's a tall, grey man in his late 60s. He has a serious but approachable face and a natural air of authority about him. He's an experienced criminal barrister and judge. He sits down at the table and clears his throat as he looks at the 12 jurors. He tells them that they are to be a juror on an extremely serious and high-profile case. The jurors sit up a bit, some exchange glances with each other. He tells them that he expects the case to last months, not weeks. What they will hear in the courtroom will be profoundly distressing and will, he regrets, have an impact on them for life. Finally, with all eyes on him, he tells them that they will be deciding the guilt of a young nurse called Lucy Letby, who is charged with the murder of eight babies and ten counts of attempted murder. The room is completely silent as the jurors take in his words. Some of them turn visibly pale as the enormity of the case that they will have to decide on hits home. After their initial questions have been addressed, Mr Justice Goss thanks them, assures them that they are doing a noble civic duty, and tells them that the case will start on Monday at 10am. Juror number four leaves the jury room and goes outside to get some air. He dials his wife on his mobile phone. Hi love, he says. This jury business I got called for. Turns out I won't be back at work anytime soon. This is the shocking true story of the British serial killer nurse Lucy Letby. Based on court and documentary evidence, this podcast dramatisation examines her shocking crimes and what became one of the biggest criminal trials of the century. Due to the distressing nature of her crimes, listener discretion is advised. I'm Joshua Perry Parker, and this is Killer Nurse, the story of Lucy Letby. Episode 4. The Trial. It is Monday the 10th of October, 2022. Inside Manchester Crown Court, the courtroom is busy. The press gallery is packed full, and in the public gallery sit the broken figures of the parents of babies who have lost their lives. They have come to see justice done. On the other side of the public gallery, the defendant side, it is empty, except for two people. Two grey figures, faces etched with pain and confusion. They are Letby's mum and dad. They have been beside their daughter this whole time and have supported her from the very start of these wretched allegations. They sit still, unassuming, dress smartly. They cannot believe what is happening to their beautiful daughter. They know their daughter better than anyone. She has never had a violent or evil bone in her body since the day she was born. She wasn't a bully at school. She has never been in a fight, never been in trouble with the law. She's never even really raised her voice. This is all just a surreal, catastrophic mistake to them. A horrific nightmare that they are yet to wake from. 
Mr Justice Goss walks in and the room goes quiet. He outlines to the court how the trial will work. He reminds all those in the room of their immense responsibility and how they must all, jurors, the media, the family, follow his orders at all times. A mistrial in this case would be hugely expensive and set justice back months, if not years. This trial must be done by the book. With his comments completed, next, Letby is brought up from the cells below the courthouse. The courtroom watches her walk in, in silence. For the families of the babies, this is the first time they have seen her since the allegations became known. They take in her every move. She looks like a fragile, withdrawn figure. Her blonde hair seen in photographs is now long gone. It's now a mousy brown colour from the month spent in jail. She is flanked by two female prison officers. She sits down and looks immediately to the ground. The jurors take her in. Some of them scribble some notes in their pads. And with that, everyone is present. And one of the biggest trials of the century begins. The first to address the jury is the prosecution. William Matthews KC stands up and begins with the prosecution's opening statement, where they outline the central arguments that they will make in their case. He addresses the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, you will all be aware of Chester Hospital. It is a hospital like so many others in the UK, but unlike so many others, within the neonatal unit, a poisoner was at work. The jury shuffle uncomfortably. He presents the core of the prosecution's case. That is that Letby was the only nurse present at the time of all of the deaths and collapses. Lucy Letby, he says pointing at her, is the direct and only correlation. The constant malevolent presence when things took a turn for the worse in these 17 children. He tells the jury they will hear medical evidence that will prove that these babies were deliberately harmed. He scans their faces. The only reasonable conclusion is that these babies were poisoned deliberately. He emphasises his words. These were no accidents. He goes on to outline each of the 17 babies' cases one by one. Babies A to Q. He tells the jury that he will prove to them that some of them were poisoned with insulin, some had air injected into their bloodstream or stomachs, and some were deliberately overfed. He goes through each baby's case in detail, explaining the circumstances and medical evidence they will hear for each one. In the public gallery, the parents in the room quietly cry while the details are recounted. The atmosphere in the courtroom is sombre, the mood dark. William Matthews moves on and pulls out a large chart. The jurors refer to their iPads, which are showing the same chart. It is the timesheet that documents Letby's presence. We say that this chart shows conclusively that Letby was the only nurse present at the time of all of the deaths. The jurors study the charts and the X's marked by Letby's name. He continues, Sometimes Lucy Letby tried to kill the same baby more than once. And sometimes a baby that she succeeded in managing to kill was not killed the first or second time, and in one case, even the third time. The jury is now shown pictures of the documents found in Letby's house after her arrest, in particular the green post-it note. He reads from the green post-it note, loudly and with impact. She wrote, I don't deserve to live. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. I am a horrible, evil person. And ladies and gentlemen, she wrote in capital letters, I am evil. I did this. He leaves a moment of silence. That 
in a nutshell, is your case. He turns around and returns to his seat. Let B's mother has, by this point, started crying, and Let B's father puts his arm around her and pulls her onto his shoulder, where she sobs quietly. The prosecution's opening statement takes a total of two days, and once finished, the court is adjourned for lunch. The jury walk out of the courtroom and head to the canteen. They are allowed to claim up to £5.71p for lunch, which is enough for the shepherd's pie on offer that day. Juror number four pushes his food around his plate. He has lost his appetite. Still trying to process the horrific accusations of murder he has heard over the past two days. It all feels so surreal. Next up in court, it is the turn of Letby's defence to outline their case in their opening statement. Mark Miller, Letby's defence, clears his throat and addresses the jury. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it is difficult to think of allegations that may be harder to stand back and look fairly and look at the actual evidence. The sympathy of everyone will rightly be with the families of the children involved in this case. We all share the same feelings and experiences. It is natural to sympathise, we all do it. We recognise the sadness, distress and anger that come with allegations like these. Nothing I can say in this trial is intended to diminish that in any way. It is obvious, where we have such terrible allegations, it would be terribly easy for emotion to overcome reason and to convict without hearing a word of evidence. There is a real danger people will simply accept the prosecution theory of guilt. But this is a theory built firmly on coincidence. He makes eye contact with juror number four. After all the evidence you will hear, what we are left with is coincidence. The assumption is, the worse it sounds, the more guilty she must be. Letby was a dedicated nurse who did her best to care for infants. She did not intentionally cause harm to any baby. He points at her. She loved her job and cared for the baby's families. The courtroom is silent as everyone takes in his every word. He tells the jury that he will be calling Letby herself to give evidence, for her to prove that she's done nothing wrong. You won't get your answers to what Letby is like through seeing her in the dock. This is what she is like six years after the allegations started. That, as you can imagine, is gruelling for anyone. You may want to keep that in mind as we go through the evidence in this case. A young woman who trained hard to be a nurse and looked after many vulnerable babies for years. A young woman who loved what she did and found she was being blamed for the deaths of babies she cared for. We are dealing with a real person. Let me looks up at the jury for the first time. We're dealing with a litany of allegations, not one of which has been proved. Ultimately, this case is driven by the assumption of someone doing deliberate harm combined by the coincidence of Letby's presence. You will find, from what we have heard, no evidence of her actually doing harm to any child. He references the table timesheet that the prosecution presented to the jury. He picks it up and waves it at them. This table exists because the prosecution created it, and it was put together for the purpose of the prosecution. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a self-serving document. What we have here is something the prosecution has chosen to present. It does not show the individual health of the children concerned, or the problems they had from birth, or the risks or the course of treatments, and or the problems encountered by said treatment. It does not show the other collapses and deteriorations on the ward where Let Be is not present. It does not show the shortcomings in care at the hospital. 
It does not show how busy the unit was. It does not show whether Lucy Letby was anywhere near to a child at the time of the event, or if there was a problem which could be traced before Letby's arrival. We are dealing with some of the most medically fragile babies under the most intense medical care. All of them, bar one, are premature to varying degrees. Some had considerable problems. We say that there were problems with the way the unit performed that had nothing to do with Lucy Letby. There are many examples of suboptimal care of babies in this unit. If the unit has failed, you can imagine pressures to call for an explanation, distancing the blame from those running the hospital to someone else. The blame is far too great for just one person. He turns, looks and points at Letby. In that dock is a woman who is innocent. A woman who says this is not her fault. Letby looks straight ahead. It is now the start of witnesses being called and the proceedings will begin by looking at the timeline of cases and what actions the hospital took in response. The first witness called is the neonatal unit ward manager Sarah Powell who describes the details of the investigation at the hospital and the eventual removal of Letby from the ward to an administrative job. William Matthews for the prosecution rises and asks if Letby ever made mistakes. Sarah Powell responds, Lucy did make mistakes. Everyone did. Everyone does in clinical care. We are all human. But Lucy was good at reporting mistakes. She would always complete the paperwork. She would also report mistakes that other nurse practitioners or medical staff had made, regardless of their seniority. Letby has a slight smile, a small hint of pride, perhaps. Matthews asks her to explain the review meetings they had and why they decided to remove Letby from clinical duty. Miss Powell says that the decision was made that Letby would have to come off the unit, but she says she can't remember what else was said or why they took the decision to remove her from duty. The jury eye her suspiciously. It seems unlikely to some of them that you couldn't recall such a significant meeting. Mr Matthew tries again and asks her what was being suggested at the meeting. Miss Powell responds, um, The meeting was b basically based on a suspicion. It was the suspicion that she was the common element in all of the deaths. Over the coming weeks in Manchester Crown Court, the jury is presented with a day-by-day -day timeline of the babies collapsing and of the hospital's investigation. This is a long process, as each occurrence and the hospital's defence is described in detail to the jury. There are babies A to Q to go through, and the discussion of each individual case takes weeks, not days. In particular, Dr. Simon White is called to give evidence to the jury. He was the first consultant to raise concerns about Letby to hospital management. He explains how and when he first raised concerns and how the hospital management repeatedly ignored concerns that were raised. You can hear the full details of this in episode two, It Can't Be Lucy. Juror number four listens to the details and tries to suppress a building of anger. He cannot believe how many times concerns were raised and ignored. Lives could have been saved. The judge reminds the jury that they are hearing Dr. White's account as evidence to allow them to understand the timeline. They are not here to decide on any wrongdoing by the management. That may well be another case and another trial. The trial is now several weeks in and the jurors and those present in the courtroom have settled into their new surreal routine. The jurors sit in the same seats as they hear day after day of evidence. Letby's parents drive the same journey from their house every day and sit and listen to the case. They have not spoken to their daughter for months and are missing her hugely. They have seen her transform from a bubbly 20-year-old to the grey, pale, withdrawn figure who now sits in the dock. They mouth... I love you, to her every morning as she enters the courtroom. 
Sometimes she mouths it back. The trial now moves on to a key element in the prosecution's case. This is the pathology in the cases of the deaths. Dr. Fernandez, the reviewing pathologist, gives evidence and provides his medical opinion on the cause of each of the deaths and collapses. His statements are detailed and complex, and he keeps them purely medical. The prosecution is trying to prove to the jury that, in each case, these were not natural deaths. They could not have been. They were deliberate and evil murders. For example, on the cause of death of Baby P, Dr. Fernandez says, In my view, the cause of death was inflicted traumatic injury to the liver, profound gastric and intestinal distension following acute excessive injection infusion of air via a nasogastric tube and air embolism due to administration in a venous line. In other non-medical words, he believes that baby P, like the others, were deliberately sabotaged. The jury has now heard the prosecution accounts of Letby's malevolent presence, the concerns that were raised and the investigations that took place, and the medical evidence from the pathologist that the babies were deliberately poisoned or sabotaged. The case against Letby is building. The trial is now in its fourth month, and as winter turns to spring, the jury are now being presented with the evidence of Letby's arrest and the details of the searches of Letby's house. DC Chris Matthews, who led the original searches, is called to give evidence. He wears his police uniform. A diagram of Letby's home is displayed to the court. It includes photos of her bedroom. She has a slogan on her bedroom wall which reads, Leave sparkles wherever you go. The jury take in Letby's bedroom, her fairy lights, pink bedspread and teddy bears. Not exactly what you might imagine is the typical room of a serial killer. The jury is also presented again with the copies of the post-it notes found during the searches. They are chaotic and densely packed. They include words such as, I can't do this anymore. Help me. Another post-it note features the words slander, discrimination. I haven't done anything wrong. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. I am a horrible, evil person. The note continues. I don't know if I killed them. Maybe I did. Maybe this is all down to me. Juror number four finds the notes disturbing. The chaotic writing and scrawlings, jumping from topic to topic. They appear to be from the mind of a very disturbed person. It's like something you would see in a horror movie. The prosecution now show the jury the stacks of medical handover notes that were found at Letby's house. The hundreds of medical notes, including those containing the details of baby she is alleged to have killed. Letby's defence have, so far, been gently questioning and occasionally challenging the witnesses called. There has so far been no aggressive cross-examination. They are not building their primary defence on countering what the witnesses are saying. Much of it is agreed facts. The medical documents were found at her address, and they don't dispute the fact that Letby did write those post-it notes. There is little to be gained by questioning or challenging the version of events. They instead gently hint at aspects of their forthcoming defence. They used a cross-examination of DC Matthews to point out one thing about the medical documents. Mark Miller, for Letby's defence, rises. The jury may wish to know that 257 handover sheets were recovered in the police search. Of those, only 21 related to babies in the indictment. Therefore, 236 handover sheets were not in relation to the indictment. Dr Chris Matthews also confirms when questioned that four of the babies in relation to the indictment do not feature in any of the handover notes recovered at Letby's address. Mr Miller explains to the jury that they will later hear from Letby, who will testify that the documents were taken home by accident, just a busy nurse, being forgetful about paperwork. The court is adjourned for the weekend and the jurors return home after another week of heavy evidence. 
Durin number four sits in the garden, and as he watches his children play, he tries to process the evidence the jury have heard so far. He started off thinking it would be an easy, obvious case, but he is beginning to have some doubts. Is the prosecution evidence of timesheets and post-it notes really enough to find someone guilty of 22 counts of murder and attempted murder? He sips his tea and prepares himself for another dramatic week in court. It is Monday morning, and the jury are now hearing the details of Letby's interviews with the police. The summaries of the interviews, which have been prepared and agreed by both the prosecution and defence, are read to the court. Firstly, they listen to her defence when questioned by the police about the baby's deaths. There's nothing much to go on. The police interviews go through the babies, Letby denies any wrongdoing. When the police ask, you dealt with all these babies that died, what do you put that down to? Bad luck? Letby responds, yes. Letby doesn't react as the transcripts from her police interview are recounted. The jury listens to her denials, baby by baby, case by case. To each one she responds, no. I didn't do anything. The police ask her about the post-it note found at her address. She says, I just wrote it. I was blaming myself, not for what I've done, but for what people were blaming me for. She says to the police that her scribblings were a way of her getting her feelings out on paper. She says she was worried other people would perceive me as evil if I'd missed anything medically. I didn't kill them on purpose. The police ask her why she wrote, I am evil, I did this. Letby responds, that's how it made me feel at the time. Not intentionally, but I felt if my practice was not good enough, then it made me feel like an evil person. During the police interviews, it is also revealed that Letby attended training on medical administration via a bolus at the hospital. She was, the prosecution say to the jury, therefore fully qualified and aware of the effects an air embolism could have on a baby. It is now May, seven months since the trial began, and the prosecution has completed their presentation of their case. They have presented Letby as the sole presence, the only possible killer, explained how staff and investigations also pointed the finger at Letby, they have demonstrated evidence that they believe proves that babies were deliberately killed and have finally presented the evidence found at her house. The jury has heard their argument. Now it's time to hear the other side. It is the defence's opportunity now to call witnesses and this is the moment the whole courtroom has been waiting for. First up, they call Lucy Letby. The court holds its breath as the now 33-year-old Letby is led into the witness box. She is flanked by two female prison officers. She wears a dark grey suit and is clutching a pink scarf. She looks like a pale, weak figure. The courtroom has yet to hear her speak. The parents of the baby's hearts thump as she settles into her chair. Her defence begin by questioning her. Mark Miller stands up and asks her why she wanted to be a nurse. Letby says that she always wanted to work with children and explains that she has been traumatised by her arrest. All she ever wanted to do was help people. She doesn't cry, but looks close to tears at times. She says she was devastated when removed from clinical duties in July 2016. I just could not believe it, she says. It was devastating. I don't think you can be accused of anything worse than that. Everything has completely changed. Everything about me and my life, the hopes I had for the future, everything has gone. There were times when I did not want to live. I thought of killing myself. Miller approaches Letby. Had you done anything wrong? Letby looks up. No, she replies. Miller moves on to the first significant part of her defence 
and asks her about the handwritten notes. Lucy, why did you write, I am evil, I did this? Uh, Because I felt at the time I had done something wrong, and I thought I'm such an awful, evil person that I had made some mistakes and not known. Her defence asks her how she felt after the collapses and deaths of babies. She says she was devastated each time. It was a complete shock to all of us in the ward. Mr Miller asks her, It is alleged, of course, that you did this. Did you? Letby says clearly, No. What's it like to have that allegation made against you, Lucy? It's awful. That day, I was not even supposed to be working on that night. It was just a shock to walk into that situation. You never forget something like that. Lucy, says her defence, I want to ask you why you looked up the mother of baby A on Facebook. Let B looks meekly down at her feet, like an embarrassed teenager. I think it was curiosity. I wanted to see the people behind the awful event that had happened. They were on my mind. It's a common pattern of behaviour for me. I think of somebody and then I look them up. She says it was devastating when she learned of allegations that she was harming children in her care. It was just beyond comprehension. I couldn't understand how it was happening. It was emotionally really difficult. I was lonely. I was worried. I didn't know what was going on. Could you cope with it, Lucy? No. Had you done anything to hurt anybody? No. Mr Miller raises his voice. Lucy, is there any truth in the allegations that you deliberately harmed babies? Now crying, let B wipes away tears with her hand. No. Or intended to kill them? No, repeats let B. Over the next three days, The details of the deaths and collapses are recounted to Letby. She tells the court her memory of the cases and denies any wrongdoing in each and every one of them. She is asked about her holiday to Ibiza. In the middle of your holiday, Lucy, were you planning on killing babies? No. Well, that's what the prosecution are saying. That didn't happen. And was that what was on your mind? Killing babies? No, says Letby. The pattern goes on. Her defence puts to her the allegations and she denies wrongdoing time after time. She challenges the events that the prosecution has alleged and states that, actually, she wasn't in the nursery at the time of some of the collapses, even if the timesheets have her on duty. Her responses sound familiar to the jury now. No, I would never do this. I never harmed anyone. I didn't do this. Let B repeat this mantra day after day. Her defence moves on now and wants to ask Let B about conditions on the ward. This is a key part of their argument. They intend to paint the picture of a dangerously understaffed and unhygienic unit. Text messages between Letby and a colleague on the 30th of September 2015 are shown to the court and reveal concerns over staffing in the unit. Mark Miller asks Letby about this. Lots of staff were drained physically and emotionally, Letby says. The unit was very busy. Lots of people were doing additional shifts and changing shifts last minute. It did start to have an effect on everybody. Did the unit always have sufficient staff to cover all babies at the level of need they had? Not at all times, no, Letby replies. She tells the court that underexperienced nurses were tasked with high dependency care tasks. Another text sent by Letby is shown to the court. In the message, she says the situation on the unit is shocking, potentially dangerous and a safety implication. Those jurors who have had a recent reason to visit an NHS hospital find it hard to doubt what she is saying. 
staff are stretched beyond breaking point. As Mr Miller completes his questioning of Letby, he asks her again if she has committed the crimes she is accused of. No, she replies. The idea of me doing anything like this is beyond comprehension. And is there any truth in the allegations that you deliberately harmed babies? Mr Miller asks. No. Or intended to kill them? No. Her defence rests and hands let be over to the prosecution for her cross-examination. This is perhaps the most significant moment in this long-running trial, and it's the moment the parents sat in the room have been waiting for. William Matthews KC stands and slowly approaches Letby. She avoids his eye contact and looks down at her feet. He was planning to begin by asking her about the medical documents found at her address. But first, he's noticed something about Letby over the past few days that struck him. He asks, Lucy, is there any reason why you cry when you talk about yourself and do not cry when you talk about the dead and seriously injured children? There is some stirring and noise around the courtroom. It's true. Let B did not cry once when confronted with the accounts of the baby's deaths. In fact, she answered matter-of-factly, some might say coldly. However, it was only when speaking about herself that she did show any emotion, that she did break down. Letby has not been prepared for this. She quickly denies it and responds, I have cried when talking about some of the babies. Matthews looks to the jury, leaves a gap of silence, then moves on. I want to ask you about the medical notes found at your address. Was it normal practice for nurses to take these home? No. What is normal practice, Lucy? To dispose of them. But there are times when they have come home with me in my pocket. You mean there are times when you have taken them? Not with the intention of keeping them. And tell the jury, what are your responsibilities with sensitive personal data? Um, to keep it confidential. And what would have happened in a disciplinary sense if the hospital management knew you had 250 odd handover sheets at home? I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't know what the policy would be. You're not bothered, are you, Lucy? It's not that I'm not bothered. They were at my home address, but they were still held in confidence. What? In a bin bag in your garage? The court stirs. I'm the only person who lives at the property, so yes. Asked about a number of handover sheets that were found at her parents' house in Hereford, she says her parents did not enter her bedroom. Mr Matthews continues. They are not held in confidence then, are they, Lucy? I don't believe anybody would have looked at them. Do you obey the rules only when it suits you? No, says Letby. You like telling other people what to do, but you don't quite live up to those standards yourself, do you? No. Letby is surprisingly firm in this initial questioning. The court is adjourned and Letby will face more cross-examination tomorrow. It is a second day of cross-examinations. William Matthews KC is stood up. You took a picture of a card addressed to the parents of a child who had died in dreadful circumstances at the place where she died. Letby says, the place is insignificant. My usual behaviour is to photograph things that I send or receive. Did it give you a bit of a thrill to photograph it at the place where this poor unfortunate child died? No, absolutely not. Mr Matthews continues. And how many handover sheets were found at your home? I wouldn't know. 
You have not been prepared to tell the truth about these handover sheets, have you? Let be responds. The truth is what I have told you. Mr Matthew turns and now addresses the jury directly. The defendant previously told this jury of eight women and four men that the sheets inadvertently came home with her in her uniform pocket. He turns back to Letby. Why did you then store them in a bag under your bed? Letby says, I, I can't recall. These are just pieces of paper to me. You are not telling the truth, are you? I am. Why don't you want to tell the truth? That is the truth. They have no meaning to me at all. I have copious pieces of paper and cards that I've not thrown away my whole life. Also discovered in the police searches was a blood gas reading of a baby boy, child M, who she allegedly attempted to murder. Mr Matthews reminds Letby that a nursing colleague who took the measurements had told the court that she would have disposed of the printout in the unit's confidential waste bin. He says, therefore, that Letby would have had to fish it out of the bin to keep it. Lucy, you took this out of the bin, didn't you? It was for your little collection, wasn't it, Lucy Letby? This is the first time he has used her full name. No, replies Letby. Her responses are short and blunt. She doesn't cry. She doesn't raise her voice. She is neutral and cool. The cross-examination moves on to the main substance, and now the focus is on the babies. Matthews puts it to Letby that if she agrees that certain combinations of children were attacked, then she must be the attacker. I haven't attacked any children, she replies. If the jury conclude that a certain combination of children were attacked by someone, the shift pattern gives us the answer as to who the attacker was, doesn't it? I don't, I don't agree. Why? Just because I was on shift doesn't mean I have done anything wrong. The prosecution now goes through the babies, A to Q and challenges her on each and every one. Matthews says a medical review of child A found an air bubble in his brain and lungs. Did you inject child A with that? No. Other doctors also discovered air bubbles. Matthews, that's because you injected them with air, isn't it? Letby shakes her head. On Baby B, is it your case that staffing levels contributed to some of the baby's collapses? N no, I don't know what caused the collapses, Letby replies. I do. You injected child B with air, didn't you? No, I didn't. The prosecution goes in for Letby, as she's accused of hanging around the dead baby's parents. I'm going to suggest that you enjoyed what happened, Lucy. That's why you were in the parents' room. Letby chokes on her voice, now becoming emotional. She lets out a quiet, no. When the alarm sounded that baby D had collapsed, you were found standing over him, weren't you? I can't recall this. I would have been in nursery one with my babies, but other staff may have been in and out of the nursery as well. The questioning has become more intense, and Letby requests a pause. Justice Goss agrees, and the court is adjourned. Letby is led back down to the cells. Juror number four goes home for the weekend, still trying to process the sight of a 30-year-old nurse being accused of murder. It's Monday the 24th of May, 10am. Letby has had a restless weekend, and she is now back in the dock. Matthews moves on to the case of Child E. He asks Letby if she believes his death was the result of incompetence on the neonatal unit. Letby says, collectively, the doctors could have acted sooner to react to his bleeding issue. 
when are you suggesting that something wasn't done that should have been? She says mistakes may have been made by the medical team collectively. Let be continues. Uh, it's, it's an important factor to note that there were often plumbing issues within the unit. There was raw sewage coming out of the sinks and running onto the floor into the intensive care unit. This could have had an effect and some staff may not have been able to properly wash their hands. This will form part of the defence's case. Let B is asked what that has to do with the death of any of the children involved. She doesn't answer. Child E's mother claims Letby was the only person present when she went down to see her baby before the collapse at 9pm. When Child E's mother came down at 9pm, I suggest you had inflicted an injury to cause bleeding. I do not accept that, no. You are lying, aren't you Lucy Letby? No. The mum of child E says she told her husband her child was bleeding from the mouth. You don't accept that? No, Letby replies. But you said to child E's mother not to worry and you told her to leave the neonatal unit. And then you killed child E, didn't you? No. You injected him with air. No. Just as you had done with other babies before. No. Then why in the aftermath were you so obsessed with Child E's mother? I don't believe I was obsessed with Child E's mother. She is then probed about why she searched for her repeatedly on Facebook. I often thought about Child E, she says. She searched for their mother nine times and their father once. Moving on to Child G, Letby says that there is a possibility that one of her colleagues accidentally overfed her. It is said that the infant was fed an excessive amount of milk and vomited out of her cot onto a nearby chair. I don't believe she would have, but potentially she might have mismeasured the amount of millilitres, Letby says. And is this a realistic possibility? No, she says. To have fed child G twice as much presumably would have taken twice as long. Yes, Letby replies. But the experts said that there was evidence of overfeeding. And how would they know? Which experts? Mr Matthews asks. Let B takes a sip of her water and does not reply to this question. She stares straight ahead in silence. Mr Matthews moves on. You inserted something into Child G's airway, didn't you? No. You caused the bleeding, as you did with many of these children. No, that's not true. And yet again, Lucy, you're the only one in the room. That is, you would say, an innocent coincidence. Yes. Why is it always you that ends up back in the nursery when something happens? I don't agree that it is always me. You tried to kill Child H twice, didn't you? No, says Letby. She was asked how insulin was found in the body of Child F. I don't know how the insulin got there, so I can't possibly answer how it might have happened or why. But whoever did it would have done it deliberately. Um, if it happened on the unit, then yes. That's why it was a targeted attack, wasn't it? There is silence from Letby. Sorry, what do you say? It wasn't an attack by me, Letby replies. She is then accused of attempting to murder child N twice. You sabotaged him on the night shift. In effect, by going in early. No, says Letby. You made a beeline for child N in nursery three. Within a minute or two of you arriving in that room, the baby collapsed. Yes, says Letby. And again, just bad luck, is it? Yes, says Letby. 
The prosecution concludes, to each and every baby, she has denied any wrongdoing. If someone was harming the babies, then it wasn't her. The prosecution moves on to ask her whether she believed the doctors who raised concerns about her had some sort of ulterior motives. She is asked what their motive could have been. At this time, I did not know what babies they were discussing or what the allegations were, but I was worried that any time anything went wrong, they could have put that on me. So do you think that these doctors' motives were influenced by a conspiracy? Yes, that is what I believe, she says. He challenges her on the claims of the hospital being understaffed and dangerous. But Mr Matthew says that Letby has failed to raise in each individual case at what point low staffing levels may have contributed to the collapses. He moves on to something a little more unexpected. How were you dressed when you left the house when you were arrested? I think I had a nightie on and tracksuit bottoms and trainers, Letby says. Actually, you were taken away in a blue Lee Cooper leisure suit. I don't remember. I had a nightie on. Oh, do you want me to show you a video of it? No. Why did you lie to the jury about it? I don't know. Lucy Letby, you are a very calculating woman. You like to tell lies deliberately, don't you? No. The reason you tell lies is to get sympathy from people. No. Killing these children got you quite a lot of attention, didn't it? I didn't kill these children, Letby replies. You are getting quite a lot of attention now, aren't you? Letby looks ahead and doesn't reply. And with that, the prosecution concludes their questioning. The two female officers stand up and escort her back to her cell for the night. The next day, the last witness in the case is called Mikhail Kerensky, a plumber from the hospital. This is a part of the defence's case that the hospital was unsanitary. He asserts that the hospital had issues with old pipes and the hospital's drainage system. This, at times, would cause blockages and cause raw sewage to come up through the toilets and wash basins. This caused floods in and around the neonatal unit. It's a short session and he leaves the stand. That is it. The defence has tried to build a case on Letby's denials, the lack of any direct evidence against her, and tried to paint a picture of a dangerously understaffed unit with junior staff being tasked with high dependency care and a unit with sanitation problems. These collapses were disasters waiting to happen. There are now no more witnesses left to call. And it's time for the prosecution and defence to provide their closing arguments. The prosecution goes first. We suggest that Lucy Letby has gaslighted the staff at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Doctors and nurses alike, professional people with many, many years of combined experience. She persuaded them what they knew in their hearts of hearts to be utterly abnormal was just a run of bad luck. Lucy Letby got away with her campaign of violence for so long because people didn't contemplate the remotest possibility of a nurse trying to kill tiny babies. Lucy Letby has used ways of killing babies and trying to kill them that didn't leave much of a trace. Certainly, nothing was spotted at the time as being significant. And her behaviour persuaded many colleagues that the collapses and deaths were normal. Several post-mortem examinations in isolation didn't raise the alarm because no one, no one, was contemplating the possibility of foul play. We suggest Lucy Letby is an opportunist. Some of the children she targeted were sick, but they would have recovered. She used their vulnerabilities to camouflage her acts. Lucy Letby, he points at her is a cold, 
calculated, cruel and relentless killer. She was, in effect, playing God. This is a calculated attempt by a devious woman to deflect suspicion. He sits down and it is over to the defence for their closing arguments. This whole case is built on a presumption of guilt. The events the prosecution alleged are a series of Russian dolls of improbability. Be under no doubt, not one witness has seen Miss Letby doing any of the acts alleged. Letby's presence at the time of the collapses cannot itself make her guilty of the crimes. This is not party games, let's get let be. We are not here to invent a- we are not here to invent explanations and ignore the evidence. Think about how realistic the evidence is. These are the most contrived and artificial explanations designed to make up for the fact that the evidence does not work. As a basis for conviction for someone of murder and attempted murder, the evidence the prosecution has presented is tenuous in the extreme. The evidence is so poor, it cannot be safely used to support these allegations. There is no evidence against this woman, he points at her. You must find her innocent. And that is it. After eight months, the jurors have heard all there is to hear. It is now over to them. Before they are sent to deliberate, Justice Goss begins his summing up of the case. He tells them, as I said at the very beginning, you must not approach this case with any preconceived views. You will naturally feel sympathy for all of the parents in this case. You must, however, judge the case on all the evidence in a fair, calm, objective and analytical way. To find the defendant guilty, you must be sure that she deliberately did some harmful act to the babies, which was, in the case of murder, causative of death. You do not need to be certain for the motive for harming any baby. Any decisions you do make must be based on evidence and not speculation. And with that, the court is adjourned. The jury begins its deliberations. Having spent the past eight months with each other, they have seen their fellow jurors more than their own families. They have got to know each other, their personalities, their quirks. They have discussed this case every day. Some of them have even made eye contact with Letby, even if just for a split second. Sat in the panel jury room at the side of the court, they assess the mountains of evidence. Unlike in most cases, the jury will not deliver its verdicts in one go. Rather, they will inform the judge when they have reached a decision on any of the counts. The judge will then resume proceedings to hear the verdicts in a piecemeal fashion. The jury has been deliberating now for 76 hours, and the foreman, juror number four, has informed the judge that they have reached their first decision. They have reached a decision on whether Letby is guilty or innocent of the attempted murders of child L and F. The judge informs the court that proceedings will resume to hear the first verdicts. The familiar faces of the courtroom file in. There is a thick silence in the air. While this will only be the first of the jury's verdicts, this is the moment where they will hear, after eight months of evidence, what the jury has decided. Let B's parents sit still, tightly holding each other's hands, hoping, praying, that an innocent verdict will be delivered. That this whole nightmare can be put behind them and that they can get their daughter back. The judge calls the room to order and opens proceedings. Let B is called in, and she is led up from the cells. She sits with her head down in a dark suit. Lastly, the jury file in. Have you reached a verdict on which you are all agreed? Juror number four stands and tries to steady his trembling legs. We have. On the count of the attempted murder of child F 
and L. How do you find the defendant? The room is silent. An unbearable tension hangs in the air. Guilty. Letby bows her head and starts to cry. Her mother sobs into her father's shoulder. Letby is led back down to the cells. The judge now informs the jury that they are to try to reach a majority verdict on all the other counts. He is aware that they believe that they will not be able to reach a unanimous verdict on some of the counts. Three days later, and the jury has made further decisions. As the court is resumed, the jury announces their first verdict on whether Letby is guilty of murder. Guilty, the courtroom gasps. They go on to find Letby guilty of murdering four infants and attempting to murder two more. Letby is emotionless. She stares at the floor. Letby's mother cries. This is it. Her daughter is a serial killer. She says, you can't be serious. This can't be right. As she cries into her husband's arms. As Letby is led out, she starts howling as she watches her only child be taken down. Now, after 99 hours and 38 minutes, the jury informs the judge that they have reached further verdicts. This time, when the court resumes, there is one face missing. Letby has refused to come up from her cell to hear these latest verdicts. The pattern of the jury's decisions is becoming clear, and she doesn't want to hear any more. She is found guilty of a further three murders and three more attempts. With this, she surpasses Beverly Atlet and becomes the UK's most prolific child murderer. She is also found not guilty of one of the attacks on child G, a baby girl. Letby's parents are now silent, resigned to their fate. They close their eyes and lean into each other. Five hours later, and the jury reaches another decision. Letby is cleared of a count of attempted murder. The following day, and now all of the verdicts are in, Letby refuses to come up from her cell. And this time, her parents have also not shown up. They have heard enough. The jury informs the judge that they have been unable to reach a verdict on four babies. This is too much for the parents of those children. The father of one of the babies stands up and storms out of the room. Several members of the jury now break down and cry. Other jury members put their heads in their hands and look down at the floor. It is only now that all the verdicts have been delivered that the press are able to report them and the news breaks across the UK about Letby's verdict. In total, she is found guilty of seven murders. One of those is a unanimous verdict. The rest are majority, 10 to 1 verdicts. She is found guilty of the attempted murder of six others. Two are unanimous, four are 10 to 1. She is found not guilty of attempted murder of two babies, and on four charges, the jury are unable to reach a verdict. The judge thanks the jury for their work, the commitment they have given to public service, and they are dismissed. He informs the court that he will sentence Letby on Monday. The press are packed outside of Manchester Crown Court on Monday the 21st of August, waiting to hear Letby's sentence. Under the courtroom, Letby sits in her cell alone. She pulls her knees to her chest and gently rocks. She is refusing to move, refusing to come up and hear her sentence. For the parents of the babies, this is the final injustice. They are enraged that she cannot be made legally to come up and hear her sentence. They want to see her face as she hears her sentence, see her tears, See her feel some of the pain and agony that they have gone through. In a recent development in UK law, the judge's sentencing statement will be televised and UK news programmes are streaming it live to millions of viewers. He says, 
This was a cruel, calculated and cynical campaign of child murder, involving the smallest and most vulnerable of children, knowing that your actions were causing significant physical suffering. There was a deep malevolence, bordering on sadism, in your actions. During the course of this trial, you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have shown no remorse. There are no mitigating factors. Lucy Letby, on each of the seven offences of murder and the seven offences of attempted murder, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. Because the seriousness of your offences is exceptionally high, I direct that the early release provisions do not apply. The order of this court, therefore, is a whole life order on each and every offence. You will spend the rest of your life in prison. And with that, let me joins a short list of the UK's most prolific murderers to be given a whole life order, meaning that never, ever will she be released. She is only the fourth woman in UK history to be told that she will never be released from prison. The others are Myra Hindley, Rose West and Joanna Dennehy. And so, after eight months, one of the biggest trials in UK modern history is concluded. Or is it? Less than a month after her sentence is announced, Letby's legal team state that they will be appealing all 14 charges against her. Letby, they say, is innocent. And that brings us on to our next episode. In our next episode, we will explore the arguments of those who say that this is one massive miscarriage of justice. Those who say that Letby is a victim of circumstance, an innocent nurse from a normal family, wrongly found guilty of murder. Those who say there is no evidence and that she must be freed. That's in our next episode, episode five. What if it wasn't Lucy? Thank you for listening. This podcast was written, produced, edited and presented by me, Joshua Perry Parker. While this podcast is based on true events, names and locations have been changed to protect the privacy of those involved, and some of the events have been created or dramatised to tell the story. If you found this podcast interesting, please do rate, subscribe and recommend it to your friends.